box. Hello and welcome to Con Air, the podcast. I am Mark Money Shower Hoffmeyer. I am Jay Sweaty Handshake Fluid. Welcome you aboard Con Air, the podcast for chapter 39 and chapter 40. This is the final episode of Con Air, the podcast. We've wrapped the two together because 40 is just credits. On this show, Mark and I have flown our way through Con Air scene by scene with some wonderful guests. And this is chapter 39. What happens in chapter 39 of Conair? Well, Las Vegas tourists flood the road, catching the loose cash raining from the security truck explosion, whilst Poe barely saves the only treasure he has left, the stuffed bunny, from disappearing down the drain. Poe informs Larkin that his barrier for trustworthiness has decreased, the person involved in this film who owns the most Academy Awards finds Garland Green's Ken doll, and Larkin and Malloy clear the air. Poe finds Trisha, apologises for his appearance, and makes a frankly terrible first impression upon little Casey as he presents her with her birthday present. Meanwhile, Garland Green accepts the dice and a colourful cocktail as he prepares to roll at a craps table. So this is the final chapter. This is the culmination of the podcast. This is also the, the reunion chapter where our hero meets up with his wife for the first time in eight years. So we figured, hey, we should have our wives on the show. They're not here right now. Uh, because Megan's coming. Megan's, Megan's coming. coming. Megan's coming. Uh, and when I suggested this to my wife, uh, she gave me the biggest eye roll. And uh, just didn't even deem to say no. So instead, we have the equivalent of my podcasting wife. We're talking about Trisha Yearwood again, so it's only right to have him back on again. It's Nick Rehack. Rehack, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's me. Thank you so much for having me. And I have a very sad but kind of funny Trisha Yearwood story when it comes time to talk about Trisha Yearwood. Well, let's talk about it now, then. What are you talking? Let's go. We are, for those that don't know, are recording on a Thursday. So this time last week, I'm at Trivia, and we're having a good time, and there's a trivia question about Garth Brooks' wife, and it named a couple songs that she had sung. And I locked in on uh, How Do I Feel. I'm like, I know this one. I could not think of Trisha Yearwood's name to save my life. I couldn't do it, and we lost points, and I was embarrassed. I mean, I'm like, oh, I got this, and I wrote uh, whoever, uh, uh, Tim, what's Reba McIntyre. No, <laughs> not Reba, Faith Hill. I'm like, oh, this is Faith Hill done. I'm like, no, wait a second. And then I started telling them the story. I'm like, if you guys listen to the podcast episode I'm on, and it was, you know, family and friends, and they were like, don't, don't do this right now. Don't be gross. <laughs> and I'm like, well, in the episode, if you'd have listened, we went through the whole story in history, and I'm telling them all about the Leanne Rhymes thing. I'm telling about the Grammy situation, and I was wrong the whole time. Could not think of Trisha Yearwood to save my life. So I'm a little embarrassed, but. I'm also, you know, strong enough to admit that I have a terrible memory. Did you lose by that one point? No, we lost by a lot of points. That's that's, that's okay. That's fine. (laughs) That's where the funny part comes in. Even if we got it right, it would not have helped. (laughs) Sometimes I'd rather just get blown out of the water in a competition because I don't want to lose by six. I I just want to lose by like 7,000. It's like, Mm -hmm. Mark, there's only 13 questions and you you have negative 4,300 points. Like that's how you do it. Yeah, that's how, how you lose. You this? <laughs> yeah, I just I love going down in flames if I'm gonna lose. You're just so good at it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I lo- I'm a I'm a ex I'm I'm a winner at losing. <laughs> <laughs> number one, it'd be a number two. People like listening to it. You said that when I play Lamberty, which is a show that Jay hosts, that it's stressful because I just Jay will Never. stop me sometimes from betting everything. It, okay, that's because I thought you were definitely going to get the answer right and win up. <laughs> just give no one else a chance to uh, to come back. Basically. All they had to do was get the answer right at the end and me get it wrong. <laughs> right. Because I bet also, everything. You playing is stressful because most people, I've found, will like pick a category and work the way down that category, then onto the next category, work the way down that one. You just take a scattershot approach, like up there, down here, over there, over there. And it's just so much more scrolling to do. That's what I thought. Like most people played, but the most recent episode we had three complete newbies on, and that's how they all played. Yeah, that's how they all did it. Yes. But it was. It was. Uh, if I hadn't had you on before, I wouldn't have been able to cope. Uh, but oh, amazing! You were my practice. Well, see, for that chaos. You're welcome. <laughs> I have a question for you two. When when we meet in in person eventually, and we we shake hands, which mm-hmm. one of us is going to be John Cusack, and which one of us is going to be Nicolas Cage? So which one's because... not going to move? At 42 okay. seconds of this, Nick Cage turns his back completely. Like so, they're they're both looking at each other, and then Nick Nick Cage turns completely sideways to show off his oily back to <laughs> shake Cusack's hand, while Cusack just lifts one hand in the scene. Like Cusack doesn't move, 
and Nick Cage does. But like it's kind of like he turns his back to the audience. Which one of us? Like, how do you shake hands? Oh, I, I mean, with my right hand, I usually yeah. just go for uh, the old righty. No, I mean, it, typically it's one of those just, you know, hey, man, I've actually I've dialed back my handshaking. I've turned it in. I'm more of a fist bump guy right now. I don't know what it is, but I'm just more of like a oh, there you go. Um, but usually with a handshake, I'm I'm too concerned because when I go in for the handshake, I do a lot of the hand and then a follow up. So it's like the two hander going. Oh, I've done oh, that a lot, do and I'm hander? like, yeah, that's I, and I'll, I'll again, embar- not a, not ashamed to admit it, embarrassed by it, but it's I go in for a two hander sometimes, and I'm just there's a time and a place, and I'm never at that time or place or place with someone for a two hander. You know but, what you should do? Grab someone's hand and then take your other palm and just put it on their cheek. Ooh. Just really go, make it uncomfortable. The, the soft caress. In this, I, I, I'm much more of the Cusack because I, I never instigate a handshake. Yeah. I, I I am not a, a physical contact kind of guy. Did we have any physical contact when you were in we for must, Robin Justice I'm, I'm Wedding? I'm sure we had like a hug or something. I'm I sure. feel like we hugged at least once. I heard but about your wrestling match that was epic during the middle it, of the it wedding. Was minimal That's contact different. wrestling. It's it's unusual, but we managed yeah. to make it work. I was officiating the wedding, yeah. so I had to be yeah. like a bigger part of it somehow. But we didn't want to take away from the beauty of the ceremony, you know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But he turns his back completely to shake hands. That's what I'm going to do from now on. Whenever I shake somebody's hand, I'm just going to turn completely sideways. <laughs> and give someone a shake. Are you gonna t- so, hey man, you're gonna have this. something to tuck under your arm in situations where you always gotta tuck the bunny. Like this bunny is already in awful condition. He's just gonna add armpit sweat as well, <laughs> as well <laughs> onto this gift for his daughter. I mean, at this point, and blood. Right. It's gonna make it no worse. And blood. It's listen. It's already messy. It's already gross. You might as well get your blood on it. Yeah, it's not been white for a long time. If anything, sticking under the arm's gonna make it cleaner. Ugh, it's true. <laughs> he is very oily. At 42 mm. seconds mm. in this scene. Yeah. And also, Jay, we've talked a lot about Malloy. He gets a little bit of a redemption here. And he, he does, should not. He yeah. should be pissed off at Larkin. Like, Larkin, you just allowed a plane to obliterate the Las Vegas Strip. I could have shot it down outside of town. Well, they I mean, they have that conversation. Malloy says, he says, you OK? Larkin says, no. And, Larkin, and Malloy's like, no, no. Great start already. <laughs> Uh, and they joke, Gravity didn't shoot down her, and Logan's like, oh yeah, it worked out much better. So, I feel like Malloy's giving an easy ride, because Malloy knows that Larkin knows that this wasn't maybe the best outcome. And that, you know, they may have caused more damage than shooting it down in the desert. Who knows? Who can say? I, I feel like Malloy had Larkin landed the plane safely, perfectly, and no damage at all, Malloy would be tearing him a new one at this point. For just mm. the car, the car destruction reasons. But as it is, he know Molloy knows that Larkin's probably not going to have his job this time next week. Yeah. So, I kick a man when he's and he was and also, bored of that car anyway. <laughs> he'll get the insurance on it, which is nice. And I mean, Larkin also just turned MC Ganey and uh, teenage mutant MC Ganey into a fish fishbowl MC yep. Ganey. <laughs> so there's some respect there. They just took down a fire truck. I love this chapter starts with with Enskini's helmet just spinning. <laughs> That's, it's, it's, it's his little pith helmet thing is just spinning it on the street. That's the signify. Yeah, that guy died because we just saw, we saw him exit the fire truck through the windscreen, and now we cut to his helmet spinning. Don't know how that happened, physics or anything, but it's just there, and so there's no head inside it. The head is unprotected. I get another shot of Larkin's sandals. Yeah. Socks and sandals. Socks and sandals. All day he's been doing that. All day he's been in socks and sandals. Mm-hmm. Everywhere he's been. Driving, running. This whole place. The whole time. I've been thinking about it, Jay and Nick. And I think I have my three favorite things that came out of these 39 episodes. Do you want to hear them? Sure. Yes. I love that we sort of figured out that Cyrus the virus just completely falls apart. When he doesn't have a pre like made speech ready. And he's I like that about him. It makes him a little more human. Yeah. 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 Which I enjoy. I've liked just bagging on Cole Meany. I think we've got a lot of mileage out of Meany. Being mean to Meany. Yeah, but mean, mean to Meany. And also I just love the swamp thing. Like Swamp Thing's a beast. And I like fish tank swamp thing. Yeah. Uh, That's uh, probably my Confirmation of Swamp Thing and Pinball being the film's MVPs, or the plan's MVPs, at least. 
Uh, I'd say Swamp Thing is both film and plan MVP. Yeah. Yeah. And just, yeah, he's the reason they lit. He's the reason Nick Cage is probably still alive the way he landed that plane. Yeah. Everyone, anyone in that plane is, uh, is Swamp Thing. He's a great pilot. He's, yeah, it, it, imp- very impressive. Although, maybe not a great uh, getaway driver. Because he was driving the fire truck and he drove that thing in a big old circle. Because they are right back where they started. Because <laughs> uh, this is like, Poe did not have the bunny on him on the fire truck chase. But it's it's oh. right here when he picked it up. So they are at the money explosion site, which is where the fire truck crashed into the security truck. So they went in a big circle. They didn't go anywhere. They managed to go like up and then down the strip somehow, or through a tunnel and back around in a circle. So they were not uh, something was was trying to drive away. Failed. They did not go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Vegas is you know One there's traffic. Road. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of traffic in Vegas. You know, you'll That's turn it. around and you know they want they don't want you to leave Vegas. Like when you try to leave Vegas, you're back in there like that movie with with who is it? Jesse Eisenberg and Imogen Poots, where they try to leave oh, the yeah. neighborhood, then just drive back in it. I mean, that's, that's why the film Leaving Las Vegas is like two hours long. It's hard. It's hard to do. I can't do it. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's like that movie Jerry with Matt Dillon and Matt, Matt Damon uh, Casey and Affleck. Casey Affleck, yeah. And it, people are trying to run out of Vegas and they just can't, and then they get stuck on a rock. Oh, it's that's the Jesus. um. Uh, the executing executing angel, the what angel, the the Dali film. Oh, the exterminating angel. Exterminating angel, yeah. Where they're in a room, they just can't leave the room. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Hate it's like um. It's like you. <laughs> Las Vegas is a lot like Tony Hawk Pro Skater One video game designs. You think you're at the end, boom, you're back at the beginning. And you Whoa. just have all that fun all over again, dude. Yeah. And you have quarters in your hand for some reason. Yeah. You're like, hey, I just I've left the mall, and now I'm back in the mall parking lot. How? How is this? Okay. Well, there's an eye over there. Go get it. (laughs) (laughs) I got down the hill. How am I? How am I back up the hill? (laughs) What's going on with this jam? I like Cube, but Vegas. Yeah, or or Identity. uh, When they're leaving the (laughs) so many films, it's just a location you can't get out of. Fourteen oh eight. Cusack's been stuck in a lot of hotels. Yeah, there we go. And well, he's probably going to be staying at a hotel in Vegas tonight. After this, and he'll never leave. 2012 is him escaping things over and over. That'd be funny. Like 2012, but it's just him escaping Las Vegas for two hours, and he doesn't. Yeah, I'm not mad. I'd, I'd He's no Kurt Russell. Russell. Kurt Russell could get out of Las Vegas. Oh yeah, escape from uh, LV. Escape from Sin City. It'd be a five-minute short film. And he just <laughs> walks in, walks right, right through. Out of there. <laughs> They would we not be able to call it Escape from LV in this country because there's a, a big um, insurance company called LV in the UK. Uh, oh, so by no. calling it Escape from LV, I have to rename that here. It's be like Escape <laughs> from Vegas. Uh, a lot of people Wait. who there's like, like the head office is in my home is my town. Uh, a lot of people here who'd like to escape from LV and they cannot. The homes them. One of my favorite memories of Deep Blue Sea 2, Nick, is when we asked you if, if, if the name Slater Trent or Trent Slater is better. <laughs> oh, so I'm gonna... the, the kid that just transferred over from Cool Kid High School? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to read you five character names, Okay. and I want you to tell me which ones work better backwards. Okay. Okay? Ben Green Paul. Garland. Green Garland. No, it's Garland Green. Okay. Hey, man. <laughs> Jones, Dog Green. Diamond, Nathan. What about Jones, Dog Diamond, Nathan? Or Diamond Dog, Nathan Jones. Yeah. Okay. Let's do <laughs> Odell, Baby O. Ooh, Odell, Baby O. That's, Baby that's o. a nice one. I like that one. Odell, Baby O. Baby O, Odell? Oh, I don't like that. Baby O, Odell? No, I, I think it's good the way it is. Because if you try to mix it up, it just becomes... No. You don't like Odell, Baby O? I like Odell Baby. That's that's better. That's a punch up. Okay. Now what about Twenty Three Johnny? I mean, that's what do you <laughs> need to change on that? No, so it's Johnny Twenty Three. That's his name. But would you rather right. have it be Twenty Three Johnny? Yeah, Twenty Three Johnny all day. I mean, that just sounds Johnny like sounds like a good time. It it sounds like you're at the dentist and you've you've got his number. Like, no, Twenty Three Johnny. Come through. <laughs> <laughs> Operator Twenty Three Johnny, please. <laughs> 
swear, like, I, I just right away. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, let's go with Grissom virus the Cyrus. Wait, <laughs> Grissom the Cyrus virus. <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like a villain in like a kids game. I mean, to keep the the format, it'd be like Grissom the Vrissom Cyrus. <laughs> the Vrissom? Grissom the Vrissom. What's wrong? I had the Vrissoms all weekend, dude. Ugh. No, no, and then there's Poe Cameron. I can't, I'm too old to be doing this anymore. All this Vrissoms. Poe Cameron or Cameron Poe? Poe Cameron. Poe Cameron? Poe Cameron. Po Cameron. <laughs> Parker uh, Pinball? Bishop Ooh. Sally Guard? Oh, yeah. Can't Dance Sally? I like that one. Dance Sally can't? That's like a, that's like a who dog, wait, run dog, run, go dog, go. That's a sentence. Dance? Sally can't. (laughs) There's a comma. (laughs) Hey man, dance? Sally can't. One of those rare rare names with a comma in it, yeah. Yeah. So Jay, what's been your favorite part about going through this show? I mean, I, I agree with your, uh, uh, Finding out Cyrus is not a great villain, or not not as smart as you think he is. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, just because it, it's all the time. I, I've never appreciated how great uh, Falzon is, and like he, I, I missed him. He wasn't with us long enough, so I miss Falzon. Uh, yeah. I still r- really enjoy my uh, my theory about Darling Green. Uh, there's been people banding about that the kid, the little girl he talks to, isn't real for years. What? I I like that it's my theory of that it's his own memory. He's gone back into the first kill that he ever did, and this time he doesn't kill her, and now it's fine that he's out, because he's out in this chapter. At the end of this chapter, he's out. It's fine. It's fine. He's reformed. He's not a killer anymore. He didn't kill the little girl this time. So it's all fine. He's gonna probably lose a lot of money in Vegas. He's he found a handful of chips somewhere on the floor in all of the ruckus. And he's just gonna start gambling, and it's all gonna be fine. <laughs> he's not gonna eat the lady that's next to him. Later that night, it's not going to happen. It's all going to be fine. You don't know. It's, it's going to be fine, Nick. Is it, though? It's going to be fine. Are you sure about that? It's a happy ending. What would happen if some guys came up to Trisha at the end of this movie and were like, hey, girl. Yeah. <laughs> and then they just started messing with her. And then Cameron gets involved and kills one of them. It's that guy again. Yeah. I mean, it would be – he. I, be, I bet he would do one of those, like, you again. Oh yeah, it's, it's Billy Joe's Hey man, two I buddies. thought I told you. Maybe Cameron is a killer. <laughs> he doesn't want to come home. He's just—he really is just trying to find any excuse. Just he starts a fight with someone. <laughs> oh man, I was just out. Now I got to go back in. <laughs> just when I thought I was out. Well, Pull him and back. Baby O. Hey man, he and Baby O will be hanging out, so that's good. Eating s- snowballs. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the guy who picks up. The, the Ken doll. I mentioned in the introduction that he is the person in this film who has the most Oscars. Do you know who that guy is? That picks up the Ken doll? Yeah, the guy who picks up Garland Green's Ken doll. He says, this is a weird thing to be on a plane full of hard asses. Is he a producer? He is... Hold on, hold on, Brian... hold on, hold on. I don't Brian. know. Brian Hayes Curry. So he's an actor who was in Biodome, Dinosaur 3, Primal Species, Beverly Hills Ninja, Armageddon, Stuck on You. But he also wrote and produced Green Book. What? <laughs> he, alongside, he wrote it alongside Nick Vallelonga and he produced it alongside Peter Ferrelli. So this guy has two Oscars for writing and producing. Best Picture and Best Screenplay winner, Green Book. Yeah, wow. well, what's more important, winning those Oscars or sharing a scene with John Cusack's dad? There we go. That's a great question. One of those Oscars. Probably, yes. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Because I feel like if you look at John Cusack's dad in that, I just, I feel like it's it's almost like, oh, it's Mark Rylance. It's not Mark Rylance. Yeah. I nice was talking to, to Megan. You, yeah. Was, yeah, it does look like Mark Rylance. Very much so. Especially when you pause it right at the 50-second mark, and he's looking at him with those eyes, like those piercing, just stones of eyes. I'm like, it's my, oh, it's not Mark Rylance. I like that what you said, looking at with those eyes, and I paused it and was blinking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we almost had two Oscar winners in the frame. Uh, almost, almost. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, I, I haven't checked everyone in the cast, how many Oscars they've won, because there's a lot of credits in this film. Uh, there's, uh, so, but the one that went won through, an Oscar. Cage has an Oscar, Malkovich nominated twice, 
Um, Malkovich has never won? Malkovich never won. Buscemi's never won. Uh, Buscemi's That's never been nominated. Uh, yeah, I, I don't That's think any crime. of the other actors have any. Uh, Jeez Louise. Of, of Nick Cage movies. should have two, because he was so good in Big. Pig. Because yeah, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I loved him in Next. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Nick, do me a favor. Last yeah. week we were talking about, a couple weeks ago we were talking about Julianne Moore's hat in the movie Next. Can you Google that and just tell me what you think about it? Right now. Yeah, you'll like it. Oh, God, I hit the so table. Jay, Sorry if it makes a bump noise. If you're in Vegas and, and there's a gigantic explosion of cash, are you going to steal the bills? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'd yeah. like to think I'm better than that, but. There's, they're just lying around on the floor. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's crisp, pristine dollars everywhere. So you would uh, would you would you kind of get all kind of crazy like people would in in the states during Black Friday to like wrestle a TV away from a uh, someone else or would you be tasteful about it? I'm not gonna start destroying property or like fighting people for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just gonna collect like the guys that are jumping up in the air. They're really going for it. I'm more gonna like stick to the ground, gather, uh, and and collect. And if people start getting uh, aggressive and violent, we're gonna go. We're just gonna head out. I think it's it's uh, the boring safe answer, but that's what. Although, oh, saying that, that's what I like to think I would do. Uh, but also, I'm quite impressionable. Uh, so, like, if people start, <laughs> yeah, if, 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 I like that. Uh, I do get carried away sometimes. I was at a, a, an auction once, where I ended up buying a vacation uh, because no one was there to stop me. <laughs> um, but hey, that's what I learned. I love skiing, so you know. Uh, but yeah, I was as soon as I like placed the bid and it won, I just had that knot in my stomach like like I was watching Uncut Gems, and it was just just didn't go away until after that vacation. <laughs> um, so I feel like I could just get swept up along with it, and I don't think I would stop before getting violent. But also, I feel like if I see people looting, I might just join in. I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do that. You can get away with several grand easy. Your trip yeah. would be paid for. I would lose it immediately though, because I didn't. Like whenever you go, you go to a place and you're like, let's say you win a grand, you're like, I'm spending this because yeah. you didn't come with it. That's my that's my philosophy. So it's that okay. three grand will be gone in an instant. Yeah, Oof. if you if you break even, it feels like it's it's kind of fair. Yeah. Fine. Nick, did oh, you find the hat? So here's what I'm wondering: what's what's the question regarding the hat? What's your opinion? I don't understand it. I <laughs> it's like there's a basketball hat on. Are they all wearing basketball hats? It's the FBI. And then there's a group shot where, like, there's a bunch of them, and they all have the same hat. And it's like, well, why Why do you have this hat? What is the purpose of this hat? This hat that clearly just says L.A. on it. Like, there's no – I'm even everybody around her has the same hat. And it's like, why? You would just have a standard, like, assumedly dark blue with white and or yellow lettering, and it says FBI on it. It's a terrible hat. Yeah, terrible it's hat. not great. <laughs> and I got Megan here, everybody, again. by the way. Nick. Hey. Hi, Megan. Nick. Yeah. Hi. We're talking about Julianne Moore's hat in the movie Next. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mark is wearing a hat, relevant. and I have my hat as well, but I'm currently oh, yeah. not wearing it because I have my headphones up. I so I bought Hi, Nick. Nick's wearing the Cherry Street hat. Nice. Love so, Meg, Con Air thoughts? Yeah. Uh, Starting with the final sequence? Yeah. The exchange between, um, blanking now. Colmini and, or uh, Cusack and Cage. Yeah. Is just so funny. When, are you okay? No. <laughs> Wait, with, with, with Colmini or Nick Cage and John That's Cusack? That's Malloy. That's and Malloy. Malloy. Yeah. Yeah. They're just hilarious. It's just a wonderful little bit they have. About a, a destroyed car, and I was tired of it anyway. It's just, it's a delight. <laughs> they finally it, it, made amends. I know was, a lot of the comments. So if you watch this on YouTube, if you watch the clip like I did multiple times, um, just for refreshing, all the comments sent around the sentimentality of the scene, but their little bit at the beginning is just hilarious. Yeah, they're good together. That's why you bring these actors in. And it's so casual. Yeah. And they just, they're pros. Call me. In, but, in, um, the, in the script, he says he's getting too old for the car, which I, I oh. feel like that, that's a little bit too much self-awareness from Malloy. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I just like that it feels like he's almost cutting him off, and he's like, "Hey, I feel no, <laughs> no, like don't even finish it, don't finish it." But he that does. feels very natural to me. Like it's the way my coworkers and I talk to each other. Nope, it's a terrible week. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> you know it. We've been through it. Yeah, we just crashed a plane through the Las Vegas Strip. You know, I was going to make a joke when I came in here. Like, I just crashed my car into the garage as if it was a, a plane landing on the strip. <laughs> but that that seems a bit destructive. The we garage don't trust that. I mean, we got to do that now. I like the correction, though. The garage is fine. <laughs> the, garage, the garage is all right. No worries. Yeah, Mark, don't, don't do that. Don't. don't. No, no. I so, always wanted a third car garage. There's an excuse. Yeah, we could plow a hole. We need a we need an office. If we just drive through the side of the house, exactly. most of the work is done. Mm-hmm. I'm good with a hammer. I don't know if that helps <laughs> anything, but yeah, that's pretty the, the better there. tool for the job. That's not going to destroy a car in the process. But hey, sure. Okay. Okay. That, so one la- last thing I want to do, Jay and Nick, not last thing, and Megan. Last I'm putting thing. us all on the spot. Yeah. That's I want to do a 1990s action movie tournament. Tournament, okay. Where draft, where the four of us put together squads of five. We draft, we each pick five 1990s action films, and then I'll match us all up on movies, films, of flicks, Facebook, or Twitter, or Con Air, one of those. Mm. But let's, since we're talking about one of the most popular 90s action films, that probably is one of the most gift, gift, memed action films. Let's put together a – want to do that? Yeah. I feel like we have no choice, Let's... but yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, Jay, if you just said no. Um, <laughs> all right. We would have added some spice. Okay, I have a number We're between ending this one... podcast. We're not recording any more of this. I'll go last, but I have a number between 1 and 250 in my head. Megan, what, what, guess the number. Between 1 and 250? Yeah. 249. Okay. Jay? Uh, uh, two forty nine and a half. Nick, sixty nine. <laughs> so we're gonna go Nick, Megan, Jay, Mark. <laughs> what I wanna? <laughs> you got it, bro. Sixty nine. <laughs> what up, dude? Will the Wilson brothers get together? We got a bro day. Okay, that's from the pre-show <laughs> recording. They have to cut that out. <laughs> no, you don't. Isn't that a whole bit in the Suicide Squad? Sixty nine. I know it's a bit from Bill and Ted's. No, I know um, he he asked how many people they killed. <laughs> yeah, sixty nine. Sixty <laughs> nine. Oh when, um, yeah, yeah, that was it. When I play trivia with my uh, wife, brother in law, and future sister in law, uh, anytime there's a toss up question where you just have to guess a number, there's always some combination of four twenty and sixty nine, or we'll do a number point like six nine or point four twenty, and that's actually helped us beat out other teams before. <laughs> <laughs> Because nice. we're children. My number one with a bullet, uh, Heat. No questions Whoa. asked. All right, Megan, you're up. I mean, can I pick Deep Blue Sea? Yeah. Yes. All right, Deep Blue Sea. I know what Jay's going to do. Today. I know the assignment. It's all over folks. here. I'm here. Yeah. All right, Wait, Jay. Enemy today, Megan. Uh, I'm going to take <laughs> Die Hard with a Vengeance. Do I have three? Whoa. Oh, the uh, third I'll, one. I'll, right. I'll take Hard Boiled. Oh. Yeah. Rude. All right, Nick, you're back. Under siege. Oh, Megan. Mission Impossible. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Uh, uh, Twister. Oh man. Okay. I'm gonna lose this, but I really watch. I watched this movie lately, and I really liked it. So I'm gonna take Dark Angel with Darf. 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 Dolph Lundgren. Because <laughs> it's funny. Darf. 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 All right. Nick, face off. Oh, man. Man. I want no scenery left unchewed on my list. I want every last bit of scenery chewed up. You got Tommy Lee Jones playing a harmonica. Yes. Uh, you have you have Nick Cage acting his face off. Well, gosh. Yeah. Oh, my I didn't even mean to do that. Sure. All right, Meg, what do you got? Nailed it. Um, Independence Day? Yeah. Ooh. We'll let you have it. Uh, uh, can I take the mummy? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'll do Point Break. Mm. Wait, 90s? Yeah, yep. 1990, yeah. Point Break. Okay, sure. Right oh, hey, there we go. All right. Nick, you're back. Goldeneye. Oh, oh swine. Megan? 
Uh, speed. Oh. Uh, oh, speed's a good pick. Men in Black? Would that count as action? Or is that more sci-fi comedy? Whatever. Who cares? All right, Men in Black. I don't get sci-fi comedy. Let's see. All right, let me pick. I mean, there's one, like, super cheat code one in here. Yeah, I'm going to try to... Yeah, I'm going to try to... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. No, you know what? I'm going to lose. I love The 13th Warrior. I'm taking that. I love that movie. Mm. What a movie. All right, Nick. All right. This is the final fifth pick, right? Mm-hmm. It's the first fifth, but also the final fifth. Yeah. <laughs> For me. <laughs> I'm, I'm between three films. I'm between Cliffhanger and Hard Rain, but I'm really going to go curveball on this, and I'm going to say Lost World Jurassic Park. Whoa. Nice. Good puddle yeah. action. All right, Jay. Oh, Megan. Oh, Megan. Megan? Come on. <laughs> I was all primed. <laughs> Starship Troopers. Oh, Starship Troopers. Ah, that's such a good one. Uh, Jay. My final pick. I'm, it's my last pick. It's my last action pick. So I'm going to take last action hero. Okay. Wow. Well played. And I can't, I got to have me some Rennie, so I'm taking Cliffhanger. Sure. We left out T2. I'm very proud of us. It's not a good movie. Yeah, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't, so I don't make... understand. It's not a good movie. The first action. one, we got it, and the other one, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting, guys. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I love really it. Great. I love the take. It's awesome. Heat, Under Siege, Face Off, Goldeneye, Lost World, Jurassic Park, Megan, Deep Blue Sea, Mission Impossible, Independence Day, Speed, Starship Troopers, Jay, Die Hard with a Vengeance, yeah. Twister, Mummy, Men in Black, Last Action Hero, Mark, Hard Boiled, Dark Angel, Point Break, 13th Warrior, Cliffhanger. I would have said Boom. Daylight, but no one Solid. would have voted for Daylight. So. I mean, I lost it with Dark Angel. Yeah. But Dolph Lundgren lands the greatest spin kick. That movie is very interesting. Everyone listening, there's a movie out there called like Come in Peace or Dark Angel. And I apologize if you heard it. I'm not trying to mark explain. But it's about Dolph Lundgren battling intergalactic drug dealers mm -hmm. who are secreting serotonin, serotonin from humans. So no, they can, Aaron, endorphins? Or endorphins are one of those to go back to their planet. Yeah, all those. to go, <laughs> Boilermakers. So they can go back to their planet and sell it for like one millionth time what they're going. And so you have a drug dealer who's killing people. Another drug dealer is trying to stop him. You have Dolph Lundgren who's trying to stop them. And it's just a beautiful – it was written by David Kep. A very gets, sassy Ben Ben. Yeah, Ben Ben. And he gets eaten – Who David Kep wrote it, who gets eaten in Lost World Jurassic Park. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very fun movie. Right. I love it. If the listener wants to hear more about the film, uh, they should probably listen to Not Coming – Lambcast because it's currently winning the movie of the month poll. <laughs> we're nice. we're like yeah, yeah. three or four days away from that poll ending, so I can't say for <laughs> definite. And by the time this episode comes out, I will have edited this out if it's not right anymore. But Mark, you're currently winning. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> Mark, would that movie make for a great double feature with Repo Man? Yes, it would because they're just both a good time. They're fun mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. different, and they're yeah yeah do it. Watch them both. Repo Man, listen to that episode, and then listen to Dark Angel. There's a scene. Uh, I'll try not to swear, Jay, but Dolph Lundgren goes, what? he's like, these, these a-holes from space. Are, he's oh, like, yeah, these, he calls them a-holes. Yeah, he calls the aliens from space a-holes. He's like, these stupid a-hole aliens are chasing us, like drug hole, drug drug dealing a-hole aliens. You came in peace, now you leave in pieces. That's what he says to the alien before he kills him. <laughs> I like that line. <laughs> like th th these two guys go. It's a bad joke, but these two guys go in the strip club, and Dolph goes, "I do my best thinking here." And then the guy's like, "All the blood is leaving my brain." <laughs> <laughs> it's such. It's so nineties, but it's it's wonderful. Hey man. <laughs> hey, say. Country nice. Wes Anderson. <laughs> we had a oh. uh, eventful pre-show recording today. Uh, so we've talked about the uh, the Lock and Roy conversation. And the, the Pyro Larkin handshake. I want to have a quick second to talk about the Pyro Larkin chat, where hey Larkin, there's now three men I trust. Larkin's reply of, is one of them me? Or am I one of them? Who else <laughs> would it be? But why does this point need to be hammered home? Yeah, that's what, like, he <laughs> gave you that. You don't am ask I one of them? No, it's, it's Falzon. And we've already bonded yeah. for the 20 minutes on the plane we had together. So I can't dance and I become buds. <laughs> like, just... Is, I feel like Cusack is incapable of not seeing that. 
Yeah. Like Cusack's not a guy where you look at him, then he does like a like a like a thumbs up finger or guns. like a little yeah finger gun. Like he does one finger, finger gun, gun at you. Like, like you say something really cool, and then he'll be like, "Yeah, man, that was totally great. Like that was good. Like is it me? He just wrecked it. I don't, I don't think he's capable of, of finishing something cool. Yeah. He's just not a cool guy. Yeah. No. John Cusack's a decent guy. Okay. Well, like, no, I'm just yeah. saying, like, him, like, his characters. Like, I don't, his character's never done something that's, I've oh, never no, seen for sure. anything cool on screen. No. Like, he's just, I mean, he'd kick you in the head, that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> and also, sure. uh, everybody listening, Megan, if you ever defeat some, if you ever, um, if we're ever in Alabama at an oyster bar and you beat up some people. Okay. I'll wait for you when you're in prison. Ah. Uh, just want to let you know. Don't thank plead you. guilty. That's nice. Don't plead guilty. It doesn't work out well. <laughs> so we the can nice have a nice reunion is... scene with our daughter. Yeah. I'll have her write you letters while you're doing pull-ups. You can use the letters as bookmarks when you're reading Infinite Jest. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep a bunny for her. <laughs> Maybe get a haircut in prison before the flight. Just a suggestion. I just send Megan. I just send Megan um, books, Infinite Jest, every month, as opposed to like magazines. Since we're touching on this, did we talk about the song at all? Yeah. What do you? Th- you yep. Did you listen yeah, to this ahead. a lot? I was no. I was a big fan of country, living in South Florida, of all weird places to be in the country. But there's a very subset of the area, and both songs were popular on the radio. And I remember it being such a weird thing, because you guys know that both Trisha Yearwood and Leanne Rhymes. Yep. sang the song and it was popular oh yeah mm-hmm. it was very thing. odd which one do you like i don't know i mean i think i'm used to probably both i don't know do you like the maturity of trisha yearwoods or the youthful vigor of leon rhymes that sounds creepy <laughs> <laughs> mark She's say right. it again but try blinking the blink yeah. when you say it <laughs> or do you like the youthful vigor of leon oh, rhymes so much sweat well you know when she started, she was known for yodeling in her singing. Really? Yeah, she had a yodel. If you look it up, she had a yodel in her voice. So this was kind of a departure for her. It was a real big ballad. This is when she dropped the yodel? I don't know. It's when she dropped it, but her that was Jewel. sort of where she started out with. <laughs> Jewel yodeled a lot. Who would you rather listen to, Jewel or Leanne, Leanne Rhymes? Rhymes? I don't know. I, maybe Jewel. I kind of want to hear Leanne uh, Jules' version of Can't Fight the Moonlight now from Coyote Ugly. I mean, if I had to listen to any country, it's going to be 90s and 80s country. Yeah. None of that modern. It's where no, it's new, no new country. No country pop. No. Nick. Three cheats. When I hear pop country nowadays, I kind of mm-hmm. want to just crawl into a hole. Do you get that reaction or no? I just don't want to be around it. Oh my gosh, they've been playing it on Hits 1 recently. I just want to rip out the radio. Yeah. Like Florida, Georgia, Florida borderline. I don't know. (laughs) Borderline (laughs) personality disorder. Is that their band? Georgia Country Band? What's the name? Florida Georgia Line? Yeah, that's it. Oh man. Hurts. Yeah. I I used to be a traffic reporter for a local radio station. And Ooh. then they picked me up and they started using me. So it would be me, but I would record for three different radio stations and they would just kind of – I'd have to change out you know, the call signal at the, either the beginning or the end of it. And one of them, it was interesting. I was actually on AM radio for a little bit, and I was doing traffic during – on a conservative talk radio station during Sean Hannity's show, which is like weird because I didn't know the guy. It was just for the local outlet. So the signal, we would just catch it and kind of swap stuff around. So it was never like, hey, Nick, what's going on in Baltimore? I'm like, well, Sean, we're doing this and the other. It was just kind of tucked in. But I didn't realize that his intro theme for the show is this is how we roll. And I'm like – Okay, like that's different. Good for you, Sean. But then I heard it every single day for four straight years, and I'm like, I hate Florida Georgia Line. Like I will never listen to their music ever, ever, Oof. ever. I don't, even, I don't even know that song. Can you sing it? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I can, but I'm not going to do it. He's <laughs> singing it right now, private concert. <laughs> nope. <laughs> He's done it before. I have an entire episode of him singing Limp Biscuits. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, hot dog flavored starfish water. 
Yep. Acoustic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was patting on, I was using Walter as a tom drum. So every time I bite him, he'd be like, and it would kind of give it that like weird new metal and uh, you with the umalt uh, metal kind of vibe to it. This oh. is, Are we all going to harmonize? How do I live? No. I would do it. That would be Not very as difficult as over as Skype. As How as would it be difficult over Skype? What do you mean? What do you mean? La, 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 la. <laughs> See, we almost had it. If he kept it going, have... someone starts and then the other one just starts filing in to hear it. I love how everyone who's not editing this is saying, yes, let's do it. <laughs> you <know>. <laughs> <laughs> Jay just said no. So fast. Because it's it. singing over Skype. No. It's not going to work. I think it sounds great. Megan, what's your favorite Nick Cage movie? Ooh. I mean, I really enjoy the unbearable weight of massive talent. Yeah. He's a delight. Mm-hmm. Him and That's Pedro are a lot of fun. That's the Nick Cage movie, I'd say. That's like the Nick Cage's Nick Cage movie. Yeah, he's so meta Cage. But he's not over the top. It's no. A, it's a tough balancing act that he does in that. It is, which makes it very delightful. It's sort of like watching Barb and Star, because I'm always going to plug this movie. And they just get the tone so right that you're not annoyed or you're you're in on the joke, but it's still very earnest. Absolutely. Very earnest. And then Pedro carries it, too. I mean, Pedro always carries it. He's the best. Internet dis- daddy. <laughs> so this is... What's your so favorite from... Nick Cage movie? Oh, Raising Arizona. Oh, I thought you were going to say Mandy. Oh, well, my performance... Oh, gosh. So that's, that's the one you mentioned every episode. I feel like saying Mandy's see. your Thank favorite you, movie is a little odd, but I, I love it's, it's, it's Mandy or Raising Arizona. It's really good. Yeah, Mandy's Mandy really or Raising Arizona. I had my students watch or it. Or Color Out of Space. Mm. I don't like it. His accent. I love it's the it. movie, but Thank his you. accent gets me. That's <laughs> what kills it for me. Yeah, it. Like, his accent in Color Out of Space is three thousand times worse. But than what about Connor. Willy's Wonderland? Oh, it's amazing. That's a tough one. I know. No, Raising Arizona and Mandy are my favorite. But what about Face Off? Because it's a John Woo movie. It's just a lot. That's the point. It's too much. It's John Woo. He throws babies out of windows. Come on. (laughs) Woo hoo. (laughs) Woo hoo. It's just, he's too much. Nick, what's your favorite Nicolas Cage performance? My favorite Nicolas Cage performance comes from the Academy Award nominated. Golden Globe Award nominated, Independent Spirit Award nominated, Palm Duar Khan Film Festival winning film, Wild at Heart. Yeah. Great spin. Such a good film. Such a good film. You know, when I think Wild at Heart, I think of the horse movie, so that just threw me off. (laughs) (laughs) I love Wild at Heart. He just wears a leather jacket and throws spin kicks. He does. This is a representation of (laughs) (laughs) these spin kicks. Or this representation, representation of, me. of my First Amendment rights. <laughs> Love yeah, it. That's a good impression. What Thanks, about you, Jay? Uh, so outside of Connor, which I, love, I would say performance is pig. Film that he's technically in but isn't a Nick Cage film is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. But film that he's in is a Nick Cage film is uh, Gone in 60 Seconds. He's in the Ooh. movie. He's, but it's not like it's not a Nick Cage film. But he's in the movie. I I, I, I said it. It's a, it's one of the three categories. I would say Into the Spider Verse is a John Mulaney film. I would say it. I'd say it's it's more of a John Mulaney film than a Nick Cage film. <laughs> if we're ranking things. <laughs> what a if good I say, movie. My, my favorite Nick Cage film was Grindhouse. It's that's not that he's in the trailer <laughs> in the middle. It's not. Yeah, but one six seconds, a film <laughs> I love. Uh, with just if you think Tony has got a bonkers sporting car, scoring in sixty seconds is insane. Uh, just the amount, there's so many people in that, but I hate cars, so I don't understand why that's my favorite. <laughs> I love that he fights Christopher Eccleston, and Christopher Eccleston plays the carpenter. He loves wood. He just loves wood. He really loves and then he wood. breaks a chair to annoy him. Yeah. It's like in Men in Black when, when Will Smith's like, oh, is that your auntie? I guess that must meet your uncle. That's like his equivalent to breaking a chair. He's got a six, got a six seconds here. And he's a little oh, tired, yeah. a little <laughs> wired, and I think that is up a little appreciation. Is, oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great quote of his. Uh, so yeah. this is Cora's first time meeting Casey. 
This is Boss Moon Co. She's terrified. Understandable. Uh, let's talk about this little meeting a little bit. Cause it's, it's, the, it's all they've wanted this whole film. This is what this is the goal. So I feel like we should at least mention mention it on this podcast episode. Uh, I think Andrew Albright does a pretty good job of being terrified of this monster that's presented to her. <laughs> <laughs> he's bloody, bloody. He has an armpit bunny. With he's him. got a stink. He's got an absolutely mm. reek. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, having Mallory now, that breaks my heart. Mm-hmm. That's the first time seeing her. I like that they pan in on her face when they're doing the hug, and she just sort of looks like she's accepting it, but yeah, it's it he's, still he's, looks he's, like a bit much. He's not the dad she was hoping for. But she's going <laughs> to hug him anyway. So. I mean, they've written years. They've written many letters. But she's never. Oh, yeah, because she never saw him in prison. Yeah, she has had a, a, a picture of him. Uh, but this is going to be tainting every memory she's got. Is like, this is the guy writing to me? Sphinx. Oh, I think that I think that'd be pretty awesome. Bleeding. The first time, uh, if it's flipped, like if I first time I meet my mom, it's Sarah Connor from T2, just <laughs> shredded and covered in blood and, and like all that. And I'm like, well, this would be fun. That's kind of bad. Way yeah. to reframe it. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, hey, my mom's kind of a badass. She just <laughs> saved the world from an apocalypse. Mom? <laughs> <laughs> like John Connor saves the world, but like Hank Connor just... <laughs> hey man <laughs> hey y'all my brother's gonna save the world and i'm not even jealous i'm not Go like that him, brother. Hank. yeah i'm not like i'm like that brother that's like oh my brother's gonna save the world so i'm all jealous i'm like man, i put your hands on me and brother hank's gonna come through and just beat you up <laughs> i got john's back you mess with john you mess with me you mess with me you mess with me because john won't get my back because he's that he's got to save the world so why would he help me? Also, he tweaked his ankle the other day, yeah. so I'm trying to let him rest it. That's the first time I've ever said that. I'm kind of bummed about it. <laughs> it's making Sorry. me rethink my entire relationship with my brother. It's, <laughs> I mean, we love each other. Don't get me wrong. We're brothers and all. But, you know, now that I really think about it. I ran out of gas the other day. He wouldn't even come bring me fuel. Then he was telling me about this new coffee he found. I'm like, yeah, it's nice and all, but that's not going to help me get to where I got to go. Hey, John, how about you bring me some co- some gas? Nah. I gotta save the world. I can't. <laughs> I can't clear the table or wash the dishes. My I mom hate John. <laughs> <laughs> what if what if he cuts his wow, hand? That turned quickly. What if he cuts his hand while doing dishes and he just falls apart? You hmm. want, you just talked yourself from being a supportive brother into I don't like that guy. Listen, I'm I'm a big fan in art of character development and uh-huh. like so I mean I think this is a good story to tell. Thank you for saying that with a straight face. Because <laughs> there's always the hateful brother who becomes the good brother. I want a I want a really loving brother who's like, wait, my brother's kind of a jerk, but then was saving the world. Like that's an interesting thing. But also, you just met your mom. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure I'm. Keep, and my brother. Up. Yeah. Oh, I've lost, and your I've lost track of this technology. So. T three adoption. <laughs> Of the machines? Day. Or... Adoption day. Adoption. <laughs> yeah, because they're so cold-hearted towards each other because of that distance, that separation. That's where the loving brother, and he becomes just cold and dead behind the eyes. That's the real machine. Machine is the loss of love in the family. There you yeah. go. The real villain is the humans, not the robots. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Robots yeah. are more human-y. human-y? Yeah. <laughs> Let's try a different word there. They have more emotion. There you go. They're more humane, and they have more emotion than what the humans do. Especially yeah. now, Chat GPT. I'm sure they're just like, yeah, I got all kind of feelings. The real feelings like were just the humans we met along the way. Summarize the plot <laughs> of the new Pinocchio. Yeah, or the new Flight of the Concords. When the robots movie where they kill the humans. Oh, that's the song. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've lost it, guys. Yeah, uh, sure. So I, I really like the lights. I've, I've just got a few more beats on it about this chapter when I get to it. I really like the lights behind them as they have this meeting. I think that's a nice little backdrop to this. It's really yeah, I'm so sorry, it Jay. It's fine. I have a bunch of nonsense I need to get to during the credits. Uh, I, I did so much prep for this, and we're going to go through it. So I hope you're comfortable. Uh, so, <laughs> I wrote all of this down, and I'm going to read it. Tell me what you need, Jay. We will write this ship. I, well, I just Tell to, Mark like, to leave. That's like the last I had for this. Uh, this little chapter of like, you know, 
it's a good body shot from Fresno. Optimistic. Fine. Uh, let's 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 talk about the credits. Let's talk about the credits a little bit because we ha- we have the start of the credits uh, is in that wonderful thing that everyone loves is shots from the film with the actors and their love in this one and having a good time. I like that the work was put in to try and find scenes where all the characters were smiling because not all these characters are happy go lucky folks. So the fact that they managed to find a shot for each of them where they're like happy, even yes, Cole Meanies is like a sarcastic, oh, look at this guy, kind of, kind of smell. But I, I, I like them. I have a problem with the order of the credits. I have a problem. Every, every film that I see is the order of credits. So the order of the credits, Cole Meany, Michael T. Williamson, Nick Chinland, Renoli, Bill Malkovich, Bing Rames, Dave Chappelle, Rachel Coden, Steve Easton, Steve Buscemi, Danny Trejo, Nancy Ganey, Andrew Albright, Zach, Monica Potter, Nicolas Cage. This list is garbage. This order is <laughs> just dreadful. <laughs> I can see no sense as to what this order is. It's probably going to be agents and contracts and all that nonsense, but it makes no sense in terms of all that we see them, alphabetical, uh, prominence in the film. There's no logic to it whatsoever other than ending with Cage. Other than that, it's a crap shoot. I don't get it at all. It's. I, I, I feel like that's what you expect from the beginning of a movie nowadays. They sort of flash names in order of importance. But now we've gone to a much more auditable way where they say in order of appearance or in alphabetical order. This is madness here. Yeah. It's not. There's no Sounds logic. Like it. Like, so, <laughs> and and I. Then we get, I, I think my I think we sh- it should be Andrew Albright, Steve Easton, Renoli, Dave Chappelle, Nick Chin, and Dave uh, Dave Chappelle twice. Uh, Rich Dakota, Danny Trejo, MC Ganey, Steve Buscemi, Michael, T- Michael T. Williamson, Paul Meany, Bing Rames, Monica Potter, John Markovich, John Cusack, Nick Cage. That's what I think the order should be in terms of like reverse order of importance. Uh, no offense to Andrew Albright, yeah. she doesn't do a great deal in the film. Uh, she's great in this scene, but that's yeah. But when we get to the rest of the acting credits, we have a little special breakout featuring brendan kelly as conrad this has got to be some agent contract nonsense because brendan kelly as conrad that should not have it he should not have his own credit above the likes of the actors who played francisco sims debbie the little girl guinea it's like conrad should be down with with viking blade and the guards that's what i'm concerned with he's missing from a bunch of scenes he's the only con we, we don't know what happened to him He's he's not arrested. He's not killed. He's just missing. I, I, Maybe that's why they do it. It's like kind of a reminder of like, hey, did hey, did we solve this threat? I guarantee huh? most. And then you're left like, wait a second. But he's never named in the film. Like no one says, oh, that's Conrad. Film at any point. So like people are gonna get to the that's co- an agent thing. Gonna get to the credits and go like, Brady Kelly, it's Conrad. What the hell is that? I haven't even got a picture to identify this guy as. I yeah. This is maybe furious. Yeah. But I have a question. Where is the bunny in the credits? Not there. Uncredited. <gasps> yeah. Not even on IMDb does the bunny have a credit. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Talk about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're right about agents because Aaron Newer. I'm a big fan of Marlon Wayans, but he had almost top billing for Air. And Aaron Newer was like his agent worked out something magical for him to get top <laughs> billing on this movie. So. Yeah, they definitely like also Days and Confused, the guy who was with Mila Jovovich, he got a huge booking in that movie. Then they ended up cutting his role a lot, but he got still heavily promoted for it because of the agents. So, yeah, I think this is one of those situations. Yeah, it's just it's it's just made me so mad. Uh, <laughs> oh, and and yeah, sorry, my mouse froze. and I was like, my oh, my notes, I can't get to my notes. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, J.J. Abrams did an uncredited dialogue polish on this film. That was something I did not know until I oh, looked on it. Uh, Pretty cool. But yeah, I have a bunch of little things I wanted to get to, because this is our final episode. Or Does anyone else have any comment, anything to talk about about the credits before we get into my nonsense? No, get get into it, Jay. Right, okay. Nick, Nick, are you, do you have a question, or are you doing a... No, okay. I'm, I'm getting to it, dude. Right. I'm excited for you. Right. Uh, okay. First up, we're finishing talking about a film. Mark, what happens if we finish talking about a film? You do a bunch of the data? Yeah, I need to tell you, how is this film similar to Deep Blue Sea? <laughs> yes! So, if listeners, if you only listen to us on Kind of the Podcast, you're already missing out. Deep Blue Sea, the podcast, is where it's at, where we did this for Deep Blue Sea, the trilogy. Nick's been there a bunch of times, can be there a bunch of times in the future. Megan's been there a bunch of times. She'll be there in the future as well. Yay! 
Uh, so we've done all the Deep Sea trilogy. We're now looking at Deep Sea Adjacent. I made the logos too. You did, and they're fantastic. And uh, at the end of every film, I do a little comparison of how is this film like Deep Sea. Quite a short list this time. On air, not a very Deep Sea Adjacent film, it turns out. But here we go. Uh, main hero spent time in prison. Not enough people on board to deal with the situation when everything goes wrong. Prisoners have a carefully planned escape plan. Because Deep Sea is an escape prison. Okay. Cast members sing a song in the film. Dancing on transport. Uh, it features a Sopranos cast member. Steve Buscemi, Otto Tadoro. Uh, also, they appear together in Romance and Cigarettes. But if, we, if I started doing films that one person this, one person flat appeared in, we'd be here all day. Uh, a building explodes. A plane is destroyed. Uh, bad guy is killed by throwing an implement associated with smoking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Light a shark in Deep Sea and a cigarette in this thing or something. Uh, an old guy talks about peeing. That's a droid swimming pool. And after Cyrus dies, his leg twitches. Which happens to Michael Rappaport. You see. But I did have one other area where there are similarities. So there are 667 people credited for Deep Sea. 759 for Connor. How many people do you think these two films have in common? Ooh, well, the, we know 69. The, we, know the, <laughs> we know the prop department. <laughs> we know the costumer. So I'm going to say... Eight. Nick? P- are we talking people or departments? People. People, 69 people. Megan? <laughs> um, let's go with a guess of 40. 40. Uh, 26. So Mark Whoa. won without going over. 26 people. So we know that Trevor Raven did the score for both. So there's yeah. a bunch of musicians in both of them. So that's, a, that's like 16 oh. like Bruce Fowers in the orchestra. James Thatch is the French horn. Lad McIntosh is in the orchestra. They got the thatch? They got the thatch yeah. for the French horn? Malcolm McNabb on the trumpet. Nick Lenny Smith in additional orchestra. Sandy to Crescent in the orchestra. Sebastian <laughs> Tocher on cello. Eve Kempster on the score mixer. Tommy Johnson on the tuba. Will Kaup in the music editor. Gordon Goodwin in the conductor. Uh, Gregory H. Watkins, the assistant recording mixer. John P. Fazal, uh, faithful sound design sequences. Olivia Patton, the assistant music editor. And Paul Inford has two credits in each film as the score producer and as the music composer. But there are other people, like set dressing by Steve Fouter, both films. Dana Kristen Vale, credited as Dirk Vale, did stunts on Deep Sea and aerial coordinator for Conair. Costume design by Deborah Eckhart. Eric... Uh, Paul Quartle, apologies, uh, did the set dressing on Deep Sea and was the lead man on Con Air. Uh, Jamie wow. Heights was a grip for both. Russell R. Anderson was lead man for both. Uh, Tom Kerum, sorry, Tony Kerum was the caterer for both of these films. Uh, Sarah Catazzoni was the medic on both of them. Uh, Travis Bauman was the compositing artist on Deep Sea and the computer graphic effects for, for Con Air. And Wendy Altman Cohen. Did principal eyewear on not just Con Air and TPC, but 415 films he has done principal eyewear on since wow. the mid 90s. Like, 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 if, like if someone's wearing glasses? <laughs> Basically, yes. Like, she just. <laughs> I'm so confused. Because is, isn't that a props thing? Like, hey, my character would have glasses. Well, he would pick from these glasses. Well, but the, you go to Wendy Orman Cohen, she appears to be the best. She's done 415 Jeez. different. She's still working today. She's the director of her glasses. Anyway. So, that's amazing. I, she must have no, a really good eye for that kind of thing. Oh! Yeah. There we go. Uh, that's a and stat. speaking of using your eyes, uh, one thing after the Deep Sea comparison... It's work out how deep and how blue is Con Air. Something we always do on Deep Sea Podcast is how deep and how blue on average the film is. This makes no sense to like Con Air, but I've gone through the film and I've worked out how deep and and how blue each each moment each scene roughly estimate etc of of the film is. And normally I'd have you guess. Do you think it's deeper or bluer than Con Air uh, than Deep Sea? But of course, no point here. And it listens if you're wondering. Deep Sea is about fourteen and a half meters deep, thirty one percent blue. On average, we have a whole ranking spreadsheet. Uh, Con Air is, on average, uh, 1,241.5 meters up in the air, uh, which is, of course, about 4,073 feet. And it's 11.5% blue. Uh, 
Uh, this this is like there's a lot of blue skies, blue uniforms. I, th- I think the film would be bluer, but it's it's not that blue. There's a lot of dust, a lot of dirt, a lot of grimy scenes. Uh, so depth wise, this is this is deeper than Cliffhanger, less deep than Die Hard Two. Uh, but still not beating Nick. Still not beating your top pick of uh, Godzilla vs. Biollante. Is still our least deep film. What with that taking place in space for a while. And blueness, it's bluer than the Adventures of Ford Fairlane, less blue than Beyond the Poseidon Adventure. So there we are. And just a couple of things I've been keeping track of as we go through the film. I kept a kill count. Uh, just if, if, if listeners are wondering how many people die during Conair, there are some various YouTube uh, uh, channels that give a kill count. I disagree with all of them, it turns out. Uh, so I had a total kill of probably 40 people. Uh, some of them are unconfirmed. If you, it depends if you count whether when Poe fights uh, Sindino's men, if he kills them or not. I don't know if he does or not. If he does, then it's oh, and, it, and if Larkin, uh, if if Swamp Thing dies, which it probably dies because we have the spinning helmet, so Swamp Thing's there. Uh, so yeah, if if Sindino's gunmen are all killed, then it's forty. If they're not killed, thirty-seven. So Poe kills four. He kills Billy Joe at the start. It's Billy Bedlam, of course. He kills two people called, called Billy. Uh, he kills Diamond Dog and Cyrus the Virus Crescent. Diamond Dog, I have him down for four, four kills as well. Guard Chambers during the takeover, and three soldiers during the skirmish at uh, Lerner Airfield. Uh, Sim is good one. Ika Popovich, Warlock, him down for two. I blamed Warlock for killing Pimble, uh, just because he didn't let anyone to him. <laughs> Pimble was already going to die at that point, but Warlock gets to blame. Uh, one of Sentino's gunmen gets. He killed the guy in the radio tower. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Phil. Who Phil in the radio tower? Blade killed two. Mongoose killed two. Ajax Viking killed one apiece. Uh, the soldiers at the Neurofield killed three. Uh, Malloy, I've got down for killing two. I have Malloy killing uh, a Las Vegas driver and Johnny Twenty Three uh, because the plane crashed, and I'm blaming Malloy for the plane crashing. But you could argue that's uh, maybe Swamp Thing. Or just circumstance acting, but I don't know. Larkin killed one, but Larkin is killing Swamp Thing. And Cyrus the Virus Grissom, total kill count of 13. He killed Benson, he killed Carl's, he killed the, the co pilot. Sims, uh, guards Garner, Ryan, and Renfro during the set explosion. He shot Starkey in the head. Uh, he killed Sindino's pilot and Sindino, of course. And uh, three soldiers at Lerner Airfield. So Cyrus killed 13 people. I I was kind of debating going through and and seeing who had won the uh, the sweat bucket award on average uh, throughout the film, but we didn't give it away in some chapters, and so I'm just gonna say, Baby O probably wins the overall sweat bucket because he's always sweaty in every scene. Uh, so, and just looking back, we didn't actually assign rhymes to Con Number One and Ramirez, the two uh, criminals who we we were there at Lerner Airfield but did not get back on the plane, so they just kind of got lost in Lerner. So I like to think we we said that they were just out there. They got away, maybe. So I'm going to say there are another couple of baby years where they were r- wrongly arrested for crimes they didn't commit, and they used this opportunity to get away, or they're ninjas. And so, they, but they're ninjas for good. Con number one, Ramirez, ninjas for good. I was recently on a, a train for six hours, and on that train for six hours, I wanted to read a book. So I read a book, start to finish, while I was on that, on that train. And the book that I read was by a guy called Richard Woodley. It was Con Air, the novel. <laughs> the script oh. adaptation from Scott Rosenberg. So whilst I was reading that, I made a little list of all the differences between the book and the film. Ooh. Okay, just cut all the stuff I said and just read. <laughs> yeah, no. Just... This is the type of content yeah. the internet wants. This is good stuff. Well, this is, is a two-parter for me. I'm not going to list it. I'm going to quiz you guys on it. Okay. I've got okay. A, a multiple choice, ten question quiz to see who can come up with the best, who can guess the most nonsense from this book. Uh, first off, wouldn't really recommend it. Watch the film. The film's better. So, <laughs> <laughs> first up, what do you think is Cameron Poe's first line in the book? Your options are. Yeah, Vernon, and at least it ain't dry as last year's pig poop. Yeah, Ern, and at least it ain't as dry as last year's sheep poop. Yeah, Gary, and at least it ain't as dry as last year's viper vomit. Or yeah, Buck, 
At least ain't as dry as last year's snake spit. So, snake spit. Snake spit. My heart wants to say pig poop, but I think I'm going to go snake spit. You should have stuck with your heart naked with pig poop. Oh. Yes. There's no points for that first one. Yeah, yeah, Vernon. At least ain't as dry as last year's pig poop. Cameron Poe's first line in the book. When Poe and Trisha reunite in the bar, who do they dance to? If it's not, uh, it's not Trisha Yearwood. Do they dance to Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty, John Cougar Mellencamp, or Don Henley? Don Henley. Megan, Nick? I, I have no idea. I'm going to go Tom Petty. Megan? Springsteen, Bring Petty, Mellencamp. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty, John Cougar Mellencamp, or Don Henley? Springsteen. You, are, you all picked different ones and you're all wrong. It was John Cougar Mellencamp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wait, we, we got three out of four wrong. Yep. And we missed w- the one. Yeah, so far, yeah. Uh, Trisha sent Talent. Cameron Poe some food in prison that he eats raw. Is that food onions, yeah. potatoes, broccoli, or steak tartare? Potatoes. Broccoli. I'm going to go potatoes. Mark has got a point. It's broccoli. Yeah! He, he takes a big old bite out of some raw broccoli. That wouldn't uh, keep very well. What is the, the nickname of Hedrick Lowry, the Hispanic gang leader Poe kills in prison during the fire scene? Is his nickname Giant Car, Mighty Marlin, Great Grouper, or Big Mouth Billy Bass? The big, the first one. I like Big Mouth Billy Bass because I just like how it sounds. The Giant. Giant Car. I'm going to say Mighty Marlin. Mark's got another point. It's Giant Car. Nice. Because so, they call him the giant killer in the movie. Oh. Hed- Hedrick Giant Carp Larry is his name. Uh, so Jeez, yeah, the, the fire sequence that was cut out of the, of the film, uh, we think they cut it out because, you know, Babio would be like heroic for saving Poe. But in the process of, of uh, Babio saving Poe, Babio then trips and Poe has to save him in the book. So Poe still <laughs> comes out as being the hero. <laughs> Which character is described as having a weasel face and smiles like a ferret? Is it Garland Green? Is it Duncan Malloy? Is it Pimble Parker? Or is it Garth Falzon? Oh, it's gotta be Parker. Garland Green. Meg? Uh, which one is Steve Buscemi? Garland, Garland Green. Green. That one. No, uh, Nick's got a point. It was Pimble Parker. <laughs> hey! <laughs> On the board. He's your face and smiley pair. Other than watching a Planet, Planet of the Apes films, what is Vince Larkin's hobby? Is he into windsurfing? Does he play bass in a jazz quartet? Is he into origami or into running? Origami. Running. Origami. It's a point for Mark. He's training for a marathon. Hey. So all of the running wow. that, we had, that we pointed out him doing, that was character development. That was backstory. <laughs> 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 Whose death oh. is described as their head exploding like a dropped melon? Cyrus the Virus, Diamond Dog, Carl's the Nazi Muffin, or Billy Joe, the guy at the start. Kevin Gage. Cyrus the Virus. Cyrus. Nick? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll say Cyrus the Virus. Hey, it's Diamond Dog. Oh, <laughs> Father, father. Because uh, Poe kicks him off the fire truck in the book. Uh, uh, Diamond Dog has like a pole that he's trying to hit Poe on the bike with, and he manages to hook it on. And Poe climbs along the pole, kicks Diamond Dog off, and his his head explodes like a dropped melon, which does feel a little racist. Uh, and also, it's, you put a lot of work in for this, Jay. It's Too just much. way darker than Ted Lasso's Diamond Dogs. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're on num- number eight of, of ten. Which of these di- lines of dialogue was not in the book? So these are quotes from the film that we love that did not make it to the book. Which one was not in the book? Hooray for the sounds of Bye. silence. There's two men I trust. One of them's me. The other's not you. I'm going to save the day. 
on Sai Anara. Sayonara. Yeah, Sayonara. I'm going to save the phone. Okay. Trick question. They were all cut. Everyone gets a point. Oh! None of these classic lines were in the book. <laughs> so everyone gets a point. Uh, next question. Which of these characters was not in the book? The old timer under the truck. <laughs> That's his credit. Old timer under the truck. <laughs> uh, uh, little, the little girl. It's Levy. Popovich or female baggage handler? Which one not in the book? Sorry, which one in the book? Only Old one man of these. Under, under the car. Okay. Little Debbie. <laughs> female baggage <laughs> handler. Little uh, Debbie. Meg gets a point. Debbie is the only hey! one of those characters who's in the book. Popovich was renamed female baggage handler and old time of the truck. Do not exist in there. Uh, so all those scenes gone. Uh, uh, Pinball was just distracted by nothing. The plane just took off without him. He wasn't chatting up a lady. Final question. Which of these scenes was not in the book? The Lerner Airfield map scene with the... That's a rock. Horro, Baby, and Bishop looking at the flying car. On an early day, that might seem strange. Garland Green defining irony. Or Poe getting shot as he takes over the plane. Which rock. one? The flying car. Yeah, flying car. Great question again. None of them in the book. Oh. <laughs> All cut. <laughs> that's, oh. that's ten questions. Uh, Mark got five. Meg got three. Nick also got three. Mark wins. It makes sense. He co-hosts the show. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, other other differences uh, that didn't really make it to a question. Uh, diamond Dog is the one that has the killed woman and the cancer flag, not Cyrus. And he also ha- he has a diamond in his tooth, which we get his name from. Uh, Ginny's pining for Larkin is way worse in the book than it was in the script for the film uh, <laughs> because there are several it becomes a running joke that she's going to serve him breakfast and I quote like a geisha so I'm glad that this is mm. yeah it's a, it's a thing uh, Swamp Thing intentionally hit the radio tower with the car to knock the car off that was, part, that was Swamp Thing's excellent piloting but that's what took out the engine that was a whole thing like how did that engine get taken out somehow knocking the radio tower with the car hit it took out uh, when they're chasing the fire truck, Poe and Larkin, they're a motorbike. They're not on separate ones. They're on the same one. <laughs> oh, I would have loved to see that. Yeah, I'd like that too. Uh, so when Poe climbs along the pole, Larkin still has the bike. Uh, Swamp oh. Thing, not in a fish tank. But it, that's, it's not filled with water. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, and at the end, Larkin finds Garland at the casino table. Uh, where Larkin's like, you feeling lucky? And Garland's like, and, and Larkin's like, hey. Uh, and so, uh, like, there's a smile between them. He does go out on a date with Ginny, and uh, Malloy admonishes the cops for trying to stop Poe from leaving. So we get another little redeeming moment from Malloy. Hmm. Uh, but the main reason that I bought this book, which cost me, I think, £20, pounds, uh, uh, wow. was to find out what did Baby O do? I wanted to find out. So I feel like if it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be in this book. It's not in the book. <laughs> they didn't specify what this major character did, but they did explain more about a situation where he's not one of the worst of the worst. He, oh. he's, he's being transferred to a minimum security prison, and he's got 18 months left on his sentence. So oh, okay. It's a reduced Poe, where Poe's being released on parole. Uh, uh, Baby is not yet. Uh, they they say earlier in the book there's like there's, there's ten prisoners being transferred on this, but then none of them are mentioned ever again other than Baby O. So, uh, so that was just I was sat with my pen the whole time like they're gonna say any second what he did what he did what he's gonna do nothing not a thing it's so frustrating. Uh, I appreciate your dedication, Jay. Mm-hmm. I should have kept my mouth shut during this episode and just let you drop some cool stats on us. It's gonna be a, a long episode and that's fine. It's a, it's a fun episode. episode. You should put this up front because this is like people learn something. People need to earn this. Uh, so I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, if you've made it this far, you're welcome, listeners. Uh, one final thing. Jay moment ever. Uh, what, one, one final Jay thing. Jay gotta earn this. Clue it. That's your new nickname. <laughs> <laughs> you earn the title of the episode. Jay gotta earn this. Clue it. That's the name of the episode. No, you just gotta earn this. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna do Jay gotta earn this. Clue it. Well, actually, yeah, you pick what episode's called. Damn. 
Uh, I, I have no control of that. Well, I just want to say, uh, before we finish out today, I just want to thank all of our guests that we've had on the show. And then you're welcome. So, thank you, Nick Rehack. Uh, Sean hey, Hobrick, you're welcome. Nick DeSemlin, Norbert Morven, Rob Duff and Joe from A Free Podcast, Rebecca Sharp, Heather Baxendale Walsh, Aaron Newarth, Tierney Steele, DJ Valentine, Joey Lewandowski, Jeanette Ward, Brian Fishback, Ty Granderson Jones, David Brook, Jim O'Kane, Movie Rob, Adam Hodgkins, Richard Kirkin, Marcus Moreno, Austin Pryor, Amon Warman, Courtney Small, Todd Liebenau, Petros Patsett, Matthew Chapter, Emily Slade, Kenny Hudson, Aubrey and Emily from National Treasure Hunt, Keith Phipps, Roger Wistar, Lindsay Street, Robert Zerby, Lisa Leahy, Dylan Fields, Jessica Manzo-Kite, Jeanette Ward, Megan Hoffmeyer, and Nick again. So thank you, hey. <laughs> all, of the, all of the guests. I, I, Jeanette was on there twice as well, I think. Did I say Jeanette twice? I didn't say Jeanette twice. Yes, I did. All right. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for being guests on this show. I've had a lot of fun. Thank you, of course, to Mark for being my co-host throughout this whole time. Jay, you're the rock of this show, man. I appreciate it. You you put the work in. I really thank, thank you for allowing me to be a maniac for 40, 39 episodes. Well, anyone who has listened listens for you. I just edit it, so that's fine. No, no, <laughs> come on, stop it. it. Uh, hey, Deep Blue Sea podcast suggests otherwise. People love you, Jay. Okay. Have they like? Have you heard Ernie on that cast? And they're like, who? Yeah. <laughs> Mark needs balance, and you are great. Well, uh, and of course, thank you to our listeners for coming with us on this journey. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed flying the plane with us. I don't know. I can't. I don't know how to make the landing. <laughs> Crash in the plane. Crash, yes. There we go. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, so yeah, that's, we're swamp thing in it. That's all the nonsense I had to cover. Did I, anything you wanted to do, Mark? <laughs> no, you know, this was. I really enjoyed meeting new. Like what I love about Deep Blue Sea in this is the people we've met. I've met a lot of new people through this. Like I met Nick through this. I met uh, Heather, Jeanette, like Lisa. I think I podcast for the first time. Nick DeSemlin. I mean. I could name 80 names of people that we've recorded with that I've just met or connected with or, or I, it, like, it's, been a, it's cool. Like the people we met is re- it's really neat. And I, I'm glad we did this. I'm glad it's over. I'm glad we can focus on deep, deep blue sea, yeah. but this was, uh, this was fun. Like we've met some cool people, Jay, and we had some random conversation. We have very much so. So yes, we're not going to continue doing Con Air adjacent films. We are going to focus our efforts on doing, Deep Blue Sea adjacent films. So if you want to hear more of Mark and I, uh, Nick and Megan, and many of the guests we've had on here before, uh, talking about Deep Blue Sea adjacent films, Mark is showing his Deep Blue Sea VHS, uh, uh, brandishing at the camera violently. Uh, we'll be- We're going to record an episode about the synopsis on the back of this box. Fine. Just okay. The- <laughs> can, can I read it to you? Yes, of course. All right. Researchers on an undersea laboratory aquatica have genetically altered the brains of captive sharks to develop a potential cure for Alzheimer's disease. There's one noteworthy, unexpected side effect. The sharks got smarter, which could mean trouble for the researchers and lunch for the sharks. You can swim, but you can't hide when a tropical storm floods aquatica, plunging Samuel Jackson, Saffron Burroughs, Thomas Jane, Ella Cool Jane Moore, and a deft ensemble cast into a harrowing battle of wits against sleek, killing, and thinking machines who top out at ain't thousand angry pounds rennie harling cliffhanger Die Hard 2 masterfully directs squeezing nerve jangling suspense and thrills from a film that's a monster movie a chase movie a movie that snaps hold and won't let go dive in i think we can get like that's a lot five episodes out of that what's the back of it look like is it it's, it's gonna the, be the very water tiny text. print it can folds we, out can we get five episodes i'll do no. five wow. episodes about the back of this box okay you well, can easily well nick's on for at least one of them apparently as a... <laughs> I'll just sit in the background of the other episodes. That's so funny. <laughs> what do you think, J- What do you think, Nick? I love it. That's uh, great. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's funny because it's a joke. Yeah. So uh, look out for that, everyone. There's, there's bonus footage. Yeah, there is. What? More bonus than we haven't covered here. Fresh meat. Look at. I don't know. It's what it says. My my deep blue sea. Look at that bonus footage. Oh, the making of. Uh, VHS. That's, mm. that's okay. I think so. Yeah. Look, listen out for that episode soon. Everyone, deeply see the podcast, and uh, and Nick's going to be on soon to talk about the Pirates of the Caribbean films. We've recorded the first one already. Um, I am. Yeah, we're having a fun time. I hear it's a loose one. It is it's, very much so. It is a real loose cannon. Hashtag have you seen? And so <laughs> that's <laughs> that's gonna do it for coverage of Conair. Uh, Megan, do you have anything you want to plug? 
I just listened to a delightful audiobook called Killers of a Certain Age. Highly recommend. Okay. Uh, 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 is that like a new one or an old one or a mystery? I think or... it's from last year. Okay, I'll keep on it. Killers of a Certain Age. Nick, plugs. So I just had one originally, but then we kept talking about a couple of things, and it reminded me of something else. So it's just going to be a real quick three-plugger. Sure. Um, I've been on recent episodes of Exploding Helicopter Podcast. We've talked about the film Swamp Thing, and we talked about the film Under Siege, which I drafted in my 90s dra- uh, action film. Uh, I was recently on Movie Rob's Minute by Minute Podcast about Die Hard 2, so you can find me there, episodes 61 through 65. And, of course, I have uh, a podcast with Bubba Wheat. We have a program called Lyrical Innuendo. It's over on Spotify and everywhere else you get your podcast. We take a look at songs – uh, throughout the history of music, and we decide if they're about sex, drugs, or good old rock and roll. Recently, we talked about Weapons of Choice, uh, Barbie Girl, and Head Games, uh, all by different artists, not by the same people. Uh, so feel free to give those episodes a listen and um, share with us a song that you want us to dive into. I want to hear Aqua's Weapon of Choice. That would be really obnoxious because yeah. her voice is very high pitch. I'm not even. I'm not sure what the third song you said was. I was like, Fat Boy Slim is Barber Girl now. And hey, that would be the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly. Uh, nice. Uh, Mark, folks. I'm a bit depressed because Nick joined me to talk about Manhunter and Repo Man as well on the Movies, Films, and Flicks podcast. I was leaving that for you. I was leaving that for you. Tears streaming down my face. I was leaving that for you. Manhunter right is one of my favorite. Um, here's uh, Look, the, I don't <laughs> listen to all of appearances I've been on on shows. <laughs> But I've re-listened to, and again, just a lot of gross admittances here. I've listened to the Con Air podcast episode I was on a lot. No, because no other the, episodes. What do you mean? You've only listened to the, <laughs> that first one. No other ones. This isn't, this isn't something I know. This is something I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's that one and then the Manhunter episode. We the, the bit about coffee and everything and just the conversation in general. It's a great conversation. And people are listening to most of it, which is pretty great because you can tell your stats on Apple Podcasts and Spotify how much people actually listen to your episodes. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a good retention for Manhunter. Well, Mark listens to the one about the Desert Island movies a lot because I have <laughs> oh, to hear it one. <laughs> on the speaker on the computer. <laughs> and you're very funny, Nick. So. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> narcissistic podcast ever. Uh, great. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> we don't really listen My name to starts with letter N for a reason. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, and, you know, like, Mark starts with M as in full of myself. Mm-hmm. Mas- Does that work? Masochist? No. Uh, yeah, that's it, it, a masochist. I'm a masochist. That's why I re listen. I'm not even sure what we'll start with J in terms of the chests. Hmm. Okay, well, Deep Blue the podcast where you can listen to me and Mark talk about Deep Blue Sea films, and Nick and I have already plugged it. Uh, go back and listen to a bunch of more episodes that Nick is on or Nick wasn't on. Listen to something he's never heard before. Uh, do that. And Lampady, over on the, the Lampcast, I do that sometimes. <laughs> My first film on my site. <laughs> so, uh, so we, Con Air is done. We finished it. If they didn't make Con Air 2, then maybe we'll cover Con Air 2, but probably not. Uh, so we, <sighs> we hope you've enjoyed this ride with us. And uh, that that will do it for not just Chapter 39, but for Con Air, the podcast in general. Thank you once again to our guests this week, uh, uh, Nick Rehack, Megan Hoffmeyer, and the numerous cats who've been on screen over the course of the show. <laughs> uh, for this episode, I've been Jake Lewitt. And I'm Mark Hoffmeyer. Go and listen to Deep Blue Sea, the podcast, or the buddy gets it. Sigh.